Hey everybody, and thanks for joining my session Continuous Scope Profiling and Observability. The target audience for this presentation are Go developers and operators of Go applications. More specifically, this presentation should be useful to anybody who is interested in reducing costs or latency or fixing various production issues. Most of this presentation will be focused on profiling, but we'll also briefly discuss alternative observability tools such as Perf and eBPF and their interoperability with Go. About myself, my name is Felix Geisendorfer and I'm a staff engineer at Datadog working on continuous Go profiling as a product. Before joining Datadog, I spent six and a half years at Apple working on large factory traceability systems using PostgreSQL and Go. In my spare time, I also like to contribute to open source and a decade ago, I was one of the first core contributors working on Node.js. But these days I'm focusing on Go, including contributions to the Go project itself. I've also released a lot of libraries and standalone projects over the years, so if you want more details on any of that, you can visit my README on GitHub. This presentation is pre-recorded, so if you have any questions, you can directly ask them to me in the chat or find me in the speaker lounge afterwards. The slides for this presentation can be found at the URL shown below or at the QR code. All right, let's start with the basics. What is profiling? To me, profiling is anything that produces a weighted list of stack traces, also known as a profile. You can see an example of such a profile in the table below. The most common way to capture this data are sampling CPU profilers that interrupt the program every 10 milliseconds of CPU time and capture a stack trace. The stack trace becomes the primary key of the table and a counter column gets incremented to keep track of the number of times it has been observed. Each occurrence of a stack trace represents 10 milliseconds of CPU time that the stack trace was executing. This data can be visualized in various ways to identify performance bottlenecks. Go supports this type of CPU profiling as well as other profilers, which we'll return to shortly. So what is pro continuous profiling? Continuous profiling is simply the idea of running one or more profilers in production and continuously uploading the data to a backend for later analysis. This immediately raises the question of why you'd want to do this in production rather than a development environment. In my opinion, the main motivation for this is the fact that data distributions have a big impact on performance and are very hard to simulate outside of production, like in development environments or testing environments. Perhaps even more importantly, production profiles can provide valuable insights into ongoing incidents and their mitigation and root cause analysis. So to me, continuous profiling in production is a no-brainer, as long as the overhead of it doesn't have a negative impact on the application. Luckily, most profilers operate with very low overhead, so they quickly pay for themselves uh, with the insights that you can get out of them. Now let's talk a little bit about Go itself. The Go compiler produces native binaries like C, C++, and Rust. So naively, one might expect Go to play very well with industry standard observability tools aimed at native applications. To check this assumption, let's put Go through the duck test. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. So is Go a duck like other compiled languages? Let's find out. The first thing to know about Go is how it deals with concurrency. Instead of directly leveraging operating system threads, Go implements a flavor of green threads called GoRoutines. The GoRoutine scheduler has first-class support for networking, so internally Go uses non-blocking I.O. similar to Node.js, uh, while giving the programmer the illusion of blocking I.O. Another optimization is that unlike C, GoRoutines start with a small 2 kilobyte stack that grows dynamically as needed. As a result, Go applications can scale to hundreds of thousands of Go routines with context switching times that are an order of magnitude below Linux threads. Data sharing between Go routines is accomplished using traditional mutexes as well as channels, which are a flavor of communicating sequential processes invented by Tony Hoare. But as wonderful as Go routines might appear at first, they can be a headache when it comes to interoperability with popular debuggers and observability tools. For example, consider the following BPF trace script. I won't go into the details, but the idea is that it would print a histogram of execution times for the main.foo function by instrumenting, instrumenting the entry and return of the function. 
Please also pay special attention to the U red probe that is being used. It's highlighted in red on this slide. Because when executing the script, it will crash the Go program attached to it. The problem is that U red probes are implemented by manipulating return addresses on the stack. This assumes a static stack as found in C programs. GoRoutine stacks, however, are cloned dynamically and are frequently copied to different memory locations. The only known workaround at this point is to manually instrument all the return instructions using regular U probes. This is pretty tricky and error prone. Even if this was fixed in the future, the script would still be buggy. Notice how the latencies are tracked by using a map that has a thread ID as a key. For Go, this would have to be the Go routine ID in order for our script to work correctly. But getting a Go routine ID is tricky. One way to accomplish this is to hack our way into the scheduler internals as shown on the slide here. But this is also pretty precarious and hopefully better solutions will emerge in the future. Speaking about precarious things, Go doesn't follow the systemv AMD64 ABI calling convention that is usually used by native programs. In fact, until very recently, Go used its own calling convention, inherited from Plan 9, where all arguments are passed on the stack rather than using registers. This was an obvious performance issue, but luckily Go 1.17 just shipped with a new calling convention called ABI internal that utilizes registers. This significantly improved the performance of many Go applications, but unfortunately the new convention is still idiosyncratic. Anything else would have interfered with Go routine scalability, multiple return arguments, and other aspects of the Go language. Also, Go's old calling convention, ABI0, is still around to avoid breaking existing packages that have code written in assembly language. So you might have to continue worrying about that as well. And since Go doesn't follow C's calling convention, calling C code from Go has a complicated implementation. Go needs to allocate a static stack for C and then switch between this and the Go routine stack as needed. This also causes some function call overhead. But not everything about Go is odd. For example, capturing stack traces. Go pushes frame pointers onto the stack and it doesn't offer the evil f omit frame pointer compiler option like GCC does. Go also generates 12 unwinding and symbol tables by default. And this makes Go compatible with Linux Perf, which supports both of these unwinding techniques. If this wasn't enough, Go binaries also include another unwinding and symbol table called Go PC line tab. This might seem redundant at first, but there are some good technical reasons for this. First of all, dwarf tables can be stripped, so the runtime can't rely on them to always be present for unwinding, for example when it needs to print a stack trace during a panic. Secondly, dwarf unwinding is Turing complete. I'll give you a few moments to let that sink in. I don't know about you, but I strongly believe that creating a stack trace should not require executing bytecode in a Turing complete VM. So let's just decree that friends don't let friends use dwarf for unwinding and be glad that Go offers two viable alternatives. Anyway, as far as our duck test is concerned, I think it's fair to say that Go is an odd duck for a compiled language. From an operational perspective, this means you will often have to pay special attention to the details before attempting to throw existing debuggers, profilers, or other observability tools at Go programs, especially in production. Go is also often criticized as a pedestrian language with a limited type system. So one might ask, why bother with Go at all? In my opinion, one answer to this question is the included tooling. Go ships with really nice tooling out of the box, including but not limited to documentation, testing, benchmarking, code formatting, tracing, and profiling. Speaking about profiling, Go actually ships with five different profilers, CPU, heap, mutex, block, and Go routine. Invoking these can be as easy as passing a flag to the built-in test and benchmarking framework uh, as shown on the first bullet here. And to visualize the data, you just need to invoke another command line tool that brings up a lo local web UI with flame graphs and other visualizations. The comment for that is shown on the second bullet. Additionally, Go has a built-in execution tracer that allows to debug hairy problems such as lat latency introduced by the scheduler or the GC. And just like the built-in profilers, it also ships with its own web UI for analyzing the data. However, be careful about using the tracer in production. The overhead for a busy application can exceed 10%.
Now let's talk a bit more about the built-in profilers. Go has three profilers that can measure how Go routines are spending their time. The CPU, Block and Mutex profilers. Let's talk about the CPU profiler first. Generally speaking, Go routines can be in one of three states, executing, waiting or runnable. The CPU profiler allows you to break down the time Go routines are spending uh, while executing on the CPU. By default, the time is broken down by stack trace, which is a good way to identify parts of your code base that could benefit from optimization. Additionally, Go provides another cool mechanism called profiler labels that allows you to annotate your Go routines with arbitrary key value pairs that are inherited if your Go routine spawns another Go routine. Depending on your needs, you can use this mechanism to attach things like request IDs, user IDs, or endpoint names to your Go routines so you can understand the CPU consumption of individual requests, users, or endpoints. This is really powerful. Internally, the CPU profiler is implemented using the set itimer system call, which allow Go, uh, allows Go to ask the operating system to send a SIGPROF signal for every 10 millisecond of CPU time that has passed. When such a signal arrives, the signal handler in Go takes care of recording a stack trace and aggregating it into a CPU profile. The result is a frequency table of stack traces as we've seen before. Unfortunately, set itimer is not a great API for profiling. On Linux, it suffers from thread delivery bias and struggles to keep up when the application utilizes more than two and a half cores. This can lead to some bias on spiky workloads. The good news here is that Reese Hiltner from Twitch and myself are currently working on an upstream patch that will hopefully fix this problem by switching to the timer create system call instead. Next up are the mutex and block profile, uh, profiles, which cover the waiting time of Go routines. They're so similar that I'll cover them together. Uh, they both capture the amount of time waiting on mutexes, and the block profile also additionally captures the amount of time waiting on channels. One question you might ask yourself is why you should ever enable the mutex profile as well as the block profile at the same time, given that the latter captures both channel and mutex latencies. The answer to this question is that the way mutex contentions are tracked is slightly different between the two profiles. The block profile captures a stack trace at the lock operation, while the mutex profile captures unlock. This means that the block profile lets you identify the code that is being blocked by a mutex, whereas the mutex profile lets you identify which mutex is preventing other Go routines from acquiring a lock. Both perspectives can be useful when analyzing mutex contention problems. Another quick thing to point out here is that the block profiler suffered from a sampling bias. And I discovered this while studying the implementation details and submitted a patch that fixes a problem that will be, or that is part of the recent Go 1.17 release. Um, so you should upgrade to that version of Go if you're planning to use the block profiler. So to recap, the three time-based profilers in Go allow you to understand the execution and waiting time of Go routines, but they don't cover everything. For example, network weights are not captured by any of the profiles and you might need to explicitly instrument them using a distributed tracing framework or similar. Go routines that are runnable, but waiting for the CPU thread to become available, uh, are also not shown in any of the profiles. To debug these situations, you can look for high CPU utilization or use the execution tracer to analyze the problem. The next profiler is the allocation and heap profiler, which allows you to understand which parts of your code is heavy on heap allocations and which of these allocations are still hanging around on the heap. Go implements these memory profiles via explicit instrumentation inside of the malloc and sweep functions of the runtime, shown in pseudocode here. For every malloc call on the left side, a Poisson sampling process is used to determine if an allocation should be tracked. Under the default configuration, the goal is to track one allocation for every 512 kilobytes of memory allocated. If an allocation gets sampled, a stack trace is taken, and the relevant allocs and alloc byte counters get incremented in an internal hash map that uses the stack trace as a key. Additionally, the runtime associates the allocating stack trace with the allocation. And this then allows the sweep function, shown on the right-hand side here, um, to increment the freeze and free bytes counters when a tracked allocation is freed by the garbage collector. The result is a profile that shows the allocations per stack trace as well as the allocations that are still in use on the heap. 
and the latter is derived by calculating the difference between the alloc and free counters and can be used to look for potential memory leaks. Unfortunately, the Go runtime is currently only capable of showing you the source of potentially leaky allocations, but doesn't provide any information on what references are responsible for retaining them. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, the allocation profiler can sometimes provide better insights into where your CPU time is going than the CPU profiler itself. According to many reports as well as my own experience, it's pretty common for Go programs to spend up to 30% of their time on activities related to memory management. An even lesser known fact is that reducing allocations can have second order effects as it reduces cache threshing. In particular, it's not uncommon that reducing the allocations in one part of your program can end up increasing the performance of other code paths that have remained the same. Or as Brian Borham puts it on Twitter, if you can remove 10% of GC work, your program will run 30% faster. Your mileage may vary, but I think it's fair to say that paying attention to allocations can have a very good return on investment. The last built-in profiler is the GoRoutine profiler. It works by briefly stopping all GoRoutines and getting a stack trace for each one of them. This can be useful to debug GoRoutine leaks. Additionally, the text output format for the GoRoutine profiler can also tell you how long GoRoutines have been parked in the waiting state and what their stack trace looks like. This is one of the best way, ways to debug a Go program that appears to be stuck, since the block and mutex profiles don't show ongoing blocking events that have not yet completed. Going a step further, you can also capture a Go routine profile at a high frequency, for example 100 times per second, which can give you a wall clock profile. I've implemented an experimental profiler based on this idea called FGProf. It works well, but please be careful with Go routine profiling in production as it requires an ON stop the world phase where N is the number of Go routines. And so <clears throat> depending on your tolerance for latency outliers, this could be a deal breaker, so be careful. This concludes our tour of Go's built-in functionality. Now let's quickly talk about profiling with Linux Perf and eBPF. As mentioned earlier, thanks to frame pointers and dwarf tables, Go offers good compatibility with Linux Perf. While the built-in CPU profiler is pretty good, Perf currently offers a little better accuracy as well as alternative ways to analyze your program beyond simple CPU profiles. Perf is also very good at profiling Go programs that call out to C libraries. There's no need to fiddle around with runtime set C Go traceback, as frame pointer unwinding can deal with dual Go and C stacks quite nicely. The only downside of Perf is that it only works in Linux environments and you need to have sufficient security permissions. You also don't get access to features such as profiler labels. Another way to profile Go applications is eBPF. For example, here's a BPF trace script that performs CPU profiling for Go. The main benefit of eBPF is that it should require less context switching as stack traces can be directly aggregated in memory. This brings us to the final recap and the end of this presentation. As we have seen, Go is a bit of an odd language in the landscape of compiled languages. However, despite this, there is a wide variety of profiling and observability tools that you can use. For production usage, I recommend all of the built-in profilers, with the exception of the Go routine profiler that you should be a little careful with. The same caution should be applied to the built-in execution tracer. You can also use Linux Perf and eBPF with Go, but for now, you should stay far away from new red probes. Regardless of your choice of tools, I highly recommend the usage of continuous profiling tools so that you can always have the data at your fingertips. I hope you found this presentation useful and I'm looking forward to answering any follow-up questions you may have. And if you haven't seen it already, you should also check out my Profiler Notes project on GitHub where I continue to share my ongoing research into Go profiling with the community. Thank you so much for your attention and also thanks to the organizers for putting together this event.